I propose to now uh, move to the uh, questions and ask answers session, the, the most inter inter interesting part where the other uh, listeners can ask questions to our speakers. So we already have a bunch of uh, questions. I'll take them from here, from our chat uh, in Zoom and from the live uh, from the Facebook and try to voice myself as well as uh, Nargiza will help me. So, uh, dear speakers, the, uh, the commenters, I kindly ask you to try to answer these questions uh, uh, shortly and clearly, since we try to cover the most of the questions. So, uh, the first question is from uh, Miss Jasmine Gatt. Uh, I'd like to ask a question to Roman. You mentioned that the Central Asian countries have to act on their own for a moment because of COVID-19. COVID Firstly, uh, uh, have there been initiatives of Central Asian countries before the coronavirus, corona crisis, uh, where they try to address the issues related to BRI together? And based on, the, on that question, secondly, do you see currently signs of a closer collaboration between Central Asian countries? Thanks. Further, I will uh, uh, translate these questions. I'll put them into, into our chat so you can see them. Thank you. Okay, thank Amal. you very much yeah, for this uh, very good question. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, yes, I still believe that for the moment and uh, well, for some time after the pandemic, it's very likely that Central Asia will be uh, um, left on its own in terms of um, how to react to the crisis. Uh, of course, there might be some international uh, donor assistance coming to different countries, but I think strategically and geopolitically, countries will need to uh, <clears throat> unite more together. And probably this crisis also presents an opportunity for the countries to really start to promote uh, regional ties at a more even aggressive level than it was. And I think that the fact that there have been a lot of uh, um, growing cooperation recently uh, after some uh, political changes in Uzbekistan, I think this lays very good foundation for actually accelerating the path towards more regional cooperation and also possibly uh, integration. And I must say that I'm not really uh, familiar with, with any of the existing uh, uh, regional platforms uh, that would bring all the countries together to discuss the issues related to the joint implementation of the Belt and Road projects. And I think this is, uh, this is a very important considering how uh, big economically and in terms of the infrastructure this project is. Because I mean, in many ways, uh, Chinese projects uh, are bringing new, let's say, winners and losers to the region in terms of, I, I hear I'm talking about the economic actors. And in many ways, this uh, Chinese projects, they change the local uh, infrastructure and the whole uh, development dynamics. So you really need to have one shared voice and some cooperation on this issue uh, together. So I'm not really familiar, and this is something, again, I'd like to stress that would be very helpful to maximize uh, all the uh, economic as well as uh, uh, strategic e effects from the, uh, this new infrastructure project. Uh, and uh, actually, so far, after right of the crisis, I haven't seen much of the um, regional uh, uh, cooperation or discussion of the common solutions, but I think this, is, this will come soon. I'm pretty sure that after some ease of the measures in each country, uh, I'm pretty sure that there'll be a need to, you know, to restore some of the uh, broken supply chain and some of the channels of cooperation between the countries. So I, I really expect this, uh, this, this is coming and quite soon. Thank you, Roman. Uh, Nargiza, do we have another question? Yes, we have another question from Zarina uh, to Mr. Arne. Uh, so, uh, what about the technical implementation of the infrastructure projects in Central Asia, which are being built by Chinese companies, workers? Uh, will the COVID have an impact on the perception of Chinese workers? Yeah, Mr. Arne. Hello. Yes, I, uh, I actually alluded to that uh, earlier in my comment, but I can go through that again. First of all, uh, the technical impl impact, there will be an impact on the projects where, first of all, the companies that have been running the infrastructure projects, if they have collapsed, gone bankrupt, or if they've lost a uh, number of workers, the, the economies are in lockdown. So the, there will be a stop in a range of projects, and that'll take maybe a half year, a year, or two years for projects to resume. 
a few projects might even not resume. That can also happen. But in general, many projects will resume with potentially new companies if the existing companies that were implementing them have collapsed or have gone into bankruptcies or so big challenges that they actually have to, have to scale back. Uh, secondly, I also think that yes, in some instances, there might be an influence and change in perception of towards Chinese workers uh, because of uh, the COVID-19. But again, in, in Western China, there have been at least what the numbers indicate, very rather few cases of COVID-19 in the Xinjiang province. Um, but, but again, there might of course be some public perceptions and we see this influence of social media. And uh, so yes, in some instances there might, that might happen, but in general, the overarching trend, I do not think that it will influence and let's say stop, uh, major projects from continuing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arne, Mr. Arnes. So the next question goes to Dr. Owen. Uh, uh, here's the question. What can we expect to see in China's uh, next five-year plan? The, the, 14th, the 14th four-year plan, 21, uh, uh, 2021, 2025. Any focus on Central Asia specifically, especially given the US unclear strategy to Central Asia? Maybe you, you, have, you can share your ideas. Okay, um, it's a good question. Um, I wouldn't like to say anything too, too concretely. I'm not entirely sure, but I guess um, um, my feeling is that um, Chinese, uh, Chinese, the Chinese approach to Central Asia is very much at the margins of uh, China's overall uh, foreign policy. Um, China's much more interested in, uh, obviously, South China Sea issue, Asia Pacific, uh, countering growing, uh, well, previously growing uh, US uh, influence there. Uh, and now obviously focusing on, on, on um, as we've discussed, managing its uh, international image uh, regarding, uh, I suppose, the major world players. So I do feel that Central Asia will probably take even more of a backseat in the, in the near term uh, than, it, than it has hitherto, which has already been uh, quite marginal. Um, uh, of course, I could be wrong and um, it'll be interesting to hear what other people think about that question. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, our next question is to everybody. Question from senior research fellow at Kazis. Uh, countries have closed the borders and trying to satisfy internal uh, demand in food. Could you please describe how the COVID-19 shaped uh, prospects of food and uh, security issues in Central Asia? Should the policymakers review the way how the food chain logistics are organized? Who wants to answer? Maybe Raman Vakurchuk? Well, um, I can be brief on that, and it's a very important question, the impact on the uh, food chains. Well, I've came across the uh, international report on this issue, uh, where uh, the findings are quite interesting so far, is that the, the food industry, global food industry, hasn't had a much of an uh, impact uh, because of the crisis compared to other industries. Of course, there are some, uh, some issues, but there's still a uh, trade and um, most of the important supply channels, they have not been interrupted. Also because they are very strategically important for most of the countries. And I think that for Central Asia, this is probably uh, also the case that you still have, uh, you haven't really reached this, uh, um, the peak of the situation where we under supply. Um, and I think that, well, there, there is, uh, of course, there's a big focus on uh, keeping them functioning. But uh, what we also observe at the same time is that uh, there's a risk. There's a growing risk of, uh, the, especially in the rural areas in most of the Central Asian countries, uh, especially with the uh, poor households who have very uh, limited funding that actually has been cut because of the crisis. And this also relates to the families uh, who have, uh, they are, for example, husbands working as labor migrants in Russia, they're in a, a very difficult situation and the situation is actually getting worse uh, day by day. Uh, I think they, they have quite a number of different food security issues and probably this is, should be the main, uh, one of the main, uh, I would say, uh, goals for the government to really to, to tackle, to actually to try to uh, help the most uh, vulnerable uh, layers of the society in all countries. Uh, trying to really help them and uh, prioritize them in terms of providing assistance and uh, also social uh, services. 
but in terms of the original trade patterns, I think that uh, they're still there and uh, I haven't seen much, although, although of course trade with China has been declining, for example, by I think by 15% or so, by some estimates. But I think some of the most critical food supply chains, they have not been uh, much interrupted. Thank you, dear Roman. So uh, we have the question from the Elira Trudubaeva from AECA in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so here is the question. What do you think about the Chinese surveillance in Central Asia? Chinese technology companies have deployed FRCs, face recognition cameras in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. And the data from these FRCs have been shared with China. So guys, who, who, who wants to answer this question? Uh, maybe Timur, maybe Timur, you would like to answer? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. Uh, very good question. Um, here, I want to say that um, it is not quite, uh, I'm not sure that the data of uh, people, like personal information and um, everything else is shared. I'm not sure that uh, it is the fact that those data, those information are shared with China. Um, but there is a risk because um, the companies that provide those services for Central Asian countries are Chinese. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, by the way, um, the company that built uh, the network of surveillance cameras is um, Russian, um, but the operational system that they're working on is Chinese. Um, and I don't uh, think that um, right now those uh, surveillance systems are on the level, on the such level that uh, they collect um, very um, personal information at, at this moment. But in the future, there is a risk, of course, of um, leakage of information. But here we come to, you know, the um, dilemma uh, to whom we trust more. Um, do we uh, trust big companies like Facebook or Google who collect um, a lot more information than uh, surveillance cameras? And um, do we trust them or do we um, trust our governments? Do we trust um, our own smartphones? Um, it, it is a very deep philosophical question, I guess. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is uh, from Jasmine. Uh, I would like to ask a question to Raman. Uh, you mentioned that Central Asia countries have to act on their own for a moment because of COVID. Firstly, have there been initiative, initiatives of Central Asia countries before the corona crisis? Uh, were they tired, tried um, to address issues related to the BRI together? Uh, not, and, not uh, I, I think I think I have addressed this question a little bit oh. earlier. I'm sorry because we have too much, uh, too too many questions. Sorry. Um, maybe mm -hmm. we can address the another question uh, from Kusan Boy uh, Mama Mama Dolimov uh, to Anton. Uh, uh, can you please elaborate how this uh, strengthened focus in tactical and ideological level is likely to take place? Anton? Yes, um, so uh, about focuses, um, now it's very hard to say because situation is, is still growing. I mean, uh, now it's we don't know who, who wins in this big competition, China or United States. I think the boss uh, will lose <laughs> something. Uh, so, and but in the end, we'll see China, uh, Central Asian uh, states will move to some like a Chinese sphere. Uh, it's not like in Cold War era. Era, but uh, it uh, seems to be uh, as I um, I remember what when uh, where I said about focuses I said uh, uh, about uh, the to take an investment. So um, if before uh, Chinese uh, before Chinese. Uh, Chinese uh, officials uh, usually give the money to our states, our governments. Uh, you know. 
uh, these uh, just like recommendations, not not uh, it's not recommendations after uh, China after Central Asian states governments uh, set uh, this. Um, like pro officials uh, vision on Chinese foreign policy. Uh, but before it was just declarate. And at now we'll, we will see this more like um, to, to waiting to, to waiting, uh, Chinese uh, officials will wait for um, not only declarations, but also like moving on to Chinese stage. Um, but, uh, I also can I also can't say this clearly now because um, situation is still growing on. So maybe we'll see it later when uh, China when the situation stabilized and Chinese economy, uh, uh, yes, economy and the state uh, in China will stabilize and um, we'll see new goals of uh, Chinese foreign policy. Okay, so the next next question is to Dr. Owen. Uh, I agree that uh, the state capacity matters, irrespective democratic or authoritarian regime. But democracy is not only about the state capacity, but also about society and its political culture and resilience mechanisms, which at the end of the day are rooted in traditional culture. Do you think that we need to revisit social contract between state and society after the COVID? Do you see it as a feasible, if so, in which regions, countries of the world? Thank you. Uh, I think it's a, a really interesting question. Um, I think probably in all, all countries, all regions of the world, there will be some sort of soul searching as to, um, you know, what could have been managed better and how the state society uh, balance really sort of worked out under the pandemic. Um, and, oh, can you, can you still hear me? Someone's just get, shared their screen. Um, okay, I'll just continue. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, I, I, I think the, the pandemic has really thrown into, uh, into relief uh, the weak spots in, in every social contract, regardless of democratic or uh, authoritarian. Um, I think, uh, for example, in the UK, um, we've seen nearly a, mil a million volunteers signing up uh, to help our National Health Service, uh, but we've not given any tasks really to do. So there's, there's been this huge groundswell of people wanting to get active and not really knowing how. Uh, I think in China, people have really been um, questioning, you know, the, the state censorship of the narrative that was culminating, of course, in, in um, uh, 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 Li Wenliang's uh, death towards the beginning. So I think, um, yeah, every every country will probably have this internal uh, debate about what could have been done better and what it says about state society relations. Thank you so much. And we have uh, the next question from Mark David Miller. Great panel and discussions. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, can the local countries be expected to participate more in items of labor, both managers and workers, because of pressures on the Chinese labor market? And can BRI become more open and cooperative with more Western multilateral and government uh, development agencies? BRI puts uh, Central Asia on uh, radar for development. Uh, uh, ADB and lots of other groups are interested in the region, but BRI is doing a larger investment. If there can be better coordination and cooperation, then all countries would benefit. Uh, question to everybody, maybe Mr. Arne wants to answer. I think that in the instances where there are local workers who can work on projects, absolutely, and where there are technical skills, absolutely, there will be local capacity. Uh, in large part, the reason for why a lot of Chinese workers have been joining projects across Asia and also in Africa is because on a lot of the projects, they need technical skills to actually pr to develop the infrastructure projects. That is the main reason, but also because of a lack of uh, workers that are actually able to contribute and work on the specific projects. There are also linguistic issues sometimes, but that is not so much uh, a, a main reason. But in some instances, that can also be the fact. 
um, whether or not uh, international organizations uh, such as the ADB, ERD, EBRD, et cetera, will be joining. In some projects, yes, potentially. Um, but I think what is important to consider here is also uh, some other questions which were raised earlier, and I'd just like to comment on that, is yes, China will need to rebuild its economy after the COVID-19 pandemic, for sure. But that does not mean that China is also going to continue on the One Belt, One Road strategy. Because some people may think that, oh, just because of COVID-19, they will stop and not longer focus on that. I don't think that's the case. So we need to be able to have two thoughts in the head at the same time. China will focus on rebuilding its economy, no question, but they will also continue on the One Belt, One Road strategy because that is also two strategies. We must remember One Road is the maritime strategy because currently seven of the 10 largest ports in the world are in Eastern China. That's a very important point. Therefore, they need to develop the maritime capacity across the Indian Ocean, across the Persian Gulf, the Mediterranean, etc. They want to also develop ports and terminals. Secondly, the One Belt strategy is basically to connect Western China with Central Asia, the Middle East, Russia, South Asia, and Europe, because Western China is much less developed than Eastern China. And Western China populates, there are 300 million people living there. I traveled personally from Shanghai to Istanbul on the on overland. I saw it myself. And there is a big need to develop and provide employment for people living in Western China. And therefore, this was a strategy uh, developed by, by Beijing initially. Um, also, to Catherine's question about the Health Silk Road. And I think this is an important uh, question uh, which Catherine raised, which was also presented by China. In many ways, I think the Health Silk Road is already in operation. We are seeing China providing medical supplies to countries worldwide. And why? Because China is really the only country that has the manufacturing capacity it has. China has become an industrial superpower and a manufacturing superpower, and it provides massive amounts of medical supplies now to countries worldwide. In addition, what is going to be one major implication of the COVID-19 pandemic is that a lot of countries are going to want to develop their own national manufacturing capacity to develop health supplies, etc. In order, in order to do that, a lot of countries will need the support of China. Because China has the technical know-how, they have the turnkey solutions to provide from the design state to the delivery of the final project. And therefore, I think, I think China is going to be contributing massively and also adapt its BRI strategy to the needs of the post-COVID-19 world. Thank you. Can you hear me? So the last question, uh, because uh, we are a little bit out of time, uh, could uh, Xinjiang crisis with Muslim minorities affect the BRI project now or in future? Who would like to answer this question? Uh, Roman, uh, maybe you? Or someone else? I'm not really expert in this area. Uh, I think maybe Anton. No, Anton, Anton, maybe Anton or Anton? Anton or okay. um, I, I tried to answer it um, when I said about this new focuses of China's policy. I uh, didn't say this, but I thinking about this. Maybe it's like this problem. Uh, but um, here will be uh, the more important it's uh, economic growing. So. Um, if uh, if in Chinese Xinjiang, um, Chinese government will grow um, the regional economy, um, I think this problem of Muslims um, will be not uh, will be not grow because um, Chinese uh, because Chinese. Uh, uh, because uh, this uh, ch Muslims in Xinjiang um, will be in uh, in corporate in the uh, like in the Chinese uh, uh, the new Chinese economy. That's where, where uh, we all said this about uh, after COVID uh, after this uh, crisis, Chinese economy will be more isolated. It means this uh, economy will concentrate on its own market. 
and uh, concentrate on a market needs more resources and needs more resources it should be um, it should be um, uh, developed to uh, uh, before undeveloped uh, regions including uh, Xinjiang so uh, and give uh, and I think this chi China will give more money more uh, to more finance resources to uh, to, to develop uh, Xinjiang and uh, I think the main questions is uh, here uh, so if we talk about this uh, like um, how public opinion in Central Asians uh, look to Central uh, to Xinjiang problem mm, the, uh, it's uh, also uh, will be uh, according to uh, how is uh, Central Asian states uh, governments uh, will st uh, stabilize because uh, now we have uh, mineral resources price problem is falling down and uh, our states don't have uh, a, cur a currency to uh, to make a good uh, social situation in our state and if uh, we don't have uh, money to uh, to make our social situations uh, be uh, better uh, be uh, still as good as before um, yeah uh, uh, still as before uh, so uh, there's some uh, interiors uh, in interiors policy or so some oppositions some parts of elites can use uh, this uh, Muslims problem in Xinjiang uh, in interiors policies deals and it will be uh, a very a very uh, very big issue for china for china's growing in central asia thank you thank you anton thank you very much uh, one more comment and uh, i think we we can finalize uh, there is a comment that uh, one thing has one thing has been missed on, in today's panel but, it's uh, sorry, a I a i i b yeah uh, I hope in the future we can hear ex uh, experts' opinions on the change of AIIB strategy after the COVID, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, sorry, we missed that part. So um, the time is running now, and uh, I would like to give a floor to uh, to our uh, executive director of IWPR, Mr. Anthony Borden, for a short uh, speech. Mr. Thank Gordon. you, uh, Ermac. Uh, I'm Tony. I'm in London, and I get the ridiculous honor of um, closing out simply by having had the uh, great pleasure to listen and to extend thanks to everybody. Uh, I could say that um, Abahan has been on my case for some time now for the failure to visit uh, Central Asia in, in some time, and I'm heartbroken that because of recent events, that trip has been delayed, but if anything is the closest uh, approximation that you could get of the discussion and the richness of the issues, and of course the breadth of participants and the people listening that we have to visit, it would be this uh, amazing Zoom conference. So I want to um, first of all thank the many speakers, Catherine, Arne, Roman, Temor, and Anton. You really gave us a great tour of the issues and the challenges and, and I'm sure you underlined for us the great importance of being aware and, and opening our minds and thinking freshly about the challenges that we face, especially for such a strategically important region as Central Asia. I want to congratulate Ermek and Nargiza, who I think did a spectacular job to coordinate this so efficiently, professionally, and cordially. And of course, thank Abahan and Kabar Asia and the ADPR team who are behind all this. And I hope you see this represents so much of our work. We're really pleased to have Nupi and other partners, but above all, our participating analysts and young reporters and experts. And we really hope and believe you've given them a great perspective and some fresh uh, thoughts. Um, I certainly want to thank, uh, in closing, our very dear friends at the Norwegian Foreign Ministry. You know, not only are they generous uh, friends of out of PR, but they've demonstrated a really long-term and strategic commitment to supporting uh, uh, Central Asia 
And I think this is just something to be really applauded. And, 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 and of course, we're grateful, but we can see the benefits and the importance of this now to, to, to have a confirmed and, and consistent strategic approach. Um, we really would appreciate your feedback. I'm sure the team would love to hear from you. Um, this is uh, very exciting. It's all new. So we'd like to hear what you think. Uh, follow uh, the Kabar uh, website and our outputs and our programming. And we hope to be in touch and communicate with you more. Um, the only last thing I'd like to try, I don't know if it's possible, but are we able to thank our, uh, does it work on Zoom if we can thank all our participants by putting our hands together virtually? Maybe we could see if that works. If thank I you so much, uh, dear Anthony, for your uh, such a great speech. Uh, so uh, finally, we should end our online meeting. Dear participants, in case of additional questions, you can contact our members and write them emails. Dear colleagues, thank you for your hard work. We've had a fruitful discussion on today's topic uh, and hope our event will contribute uh, to further uh, research. A live recording of the event is available on the Kabar Facebook page. Highlights of the meeting will be posted to the Kabar website in the near future for those wishing to learn more about the event. Thank you so much. Uh, please stay safe and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your valuable reports and um, bless you. Take care. Bye bye to everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye.